what I want to talk about today is give you sort of a research update on managing greenhouse insects and mite pests. Um, what you can expect today. Well, first of all, what do I look like? Well, this is me, and that is not a green screen. That is Venice when we were visiting there. And if you look far to the right, that was where the Rialto Bridge was, is at. So uh, if ever we're back to traveling, I do recommend uh, going to Venice. It's quite an experience. So what you can expect today is I want to give you a brief introduction. Then we're going to talk about what we call new pesticides, in this case, insecticides and miticides for use in greenhouse production systems. Then I'll cover some of our research with row beetle, Delosia coriara, also the old name was Atheta, and Western flower thrips. Then I want to focus on some of uh, our recent research and continuing research with quality assessment of biological control agents. And then there should be enough time for some question discussions at the very end. I'm really excited to talk about these, give you an update uh, on some of the new pesticides, some of our research, and uh, hopefully this information will be useful, useful to you in the upcoming growing season. Well, first of all, as you know, greenhouse grown horticulture crops are susceptible to a wide variety or range of insect pests many times simultaneously. So one of the areas where we've changed is we've, we've gotten away from um, talking about single insect pests and more talking about complex pest interactions. You know, greenhouse growers are growing polycultures, they're growing ornamentals and vegetables and herbs, and consequently, that's going to result in dealing with a wide variety of insect pests, including aphids, fungus gnats, and two spotted spider mites, and a lot of times you can be dealing with those uh, simultaneously. So, the primary, and you know, there's been some changes, but still, the primary means of suppressing insect and mite pest populations in greenhouses in general is the application of insecticides and miticides overall. And we'll talk about some of the, the, the changes that are occurring. First of all, um, what, you're, what you're not seeing is the regular introduction of new active ingredients. And there are two main reasons for that. One is the merging of many companies. We've seen Monsanto be bought by Bayer. We've seen uh, DuPont uh, link up with Dow AgroSciences. We've seen um, Syngenta with Chemtura. You know, all these mergers that are occurring have now reduced the number of companies that are going through the research and developmental phase of new active ingredients. The other one is the cost. In general, to get a new active out there through the development and process and the introduction phase, about $300 million. And that time is about 8 to 11 years. And of course, the patent is 17 years, so the company has about 6 years to recoup the investment, uh, the financial investment within a very short period of time. Uh, I know very, uh, in the last 5 years, we have evaluated very few new active ingredients or numbered compounds. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, or that can be some questions later on as we go through. Also, the regulations, uh, laws and regulations, the stringent laws and regulations have, have impact that also. So what we've actually gone through, if you look back many years as a perspective, we used to have broad spectrum pesticides, and I'm sure many of you remember a product called Temic Aldicarb. We had Oxymel and Lanate and, you know, these things, uh, they killed insects, but they killed humans and everything else. So they were quite toxic overall, and that resulted in a transition into we called narrow spectrum pesticides, also called selective, that were uh, less toxic to humans, less harmful to the environment. But also one of the issues, they didn't kill the broad range of insect and mite pests that the broad spectrum's done. And that has led to some issues like tank mixing, which I'm actually giving a talk tomorrow for a plant health conference. Uh, so there's been some, some changes that are occurring. We've gone from broad spectrum, very toxic materials to narrow spectrum, uh, less harmful, which we want, um, maybe products you can integrate with biologic control agents and some other issues. So one of the, what, one of the questions we run into is what constitutes a new pesticide? In general, a new pesticide should have a very different distinct mode of action. That was the old definition. However, it's been modified. And as we go through, you'll see some of these may not be actually new pesticides overall, but we'll do that as we go through the presentation at, at a very, a very sound pace. So 
What I want to talk about is I look back over the last three to four years, and these would be the ones that I consider new. Altus, Picana, Novato, Ventigra, Bellifera, Sarissa, and Pradia. Okay, so these are the the one the the, the uh, well we have about one two three four five seven that we'll be talking about, but I think as you'll see as we go through the presentation, some of these would really not be considered new pesticides. So let's go through number one, Altus. The active ingredient is fluoroparadophon. It's registered for use in greenhouses, for ornamentals and vegetables, and outdoors for fruit and nut crops. The REI is four hours, except if you're in California, it's a 12-hour REI. It's target primarily sucking insects, aphids, leaf hoppers, mealybugs, plant bugs, psyllids, certain scales, and white flies. Here's where it gets a little sticky. The mode of action is a nicotinic acetyl receptor modulator under the IRAC designation, that's 4D. That's very, very close to the neonicotinoids. Which, what about bee activity? Well, it's top, this is from their label, toxic to adult bees in laboratory studies via oral exposure, that is consumption. However, not toxic to bees through contact exposure, that would be dermal exposure. And field studies conducted with this product have shown no effects on honeybee colony development. Uh, however, that is not true overall, and I can't get into that right now because of length of time, but that is not true based on some more recent studies. If you look at the IRAC designation, the IRAC stands for the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. I've been a member. It's an organization that classifies, in this case, insecticides and miticides into their distinct modes of action. Uh, based on their physiology or metabolic activity on insects. There's also one for fungicides and one for, for herbicides. Okay, so when you look at IRET designations, the main group or primary site you'll see a number designation for, that's nicotinic acetoreceptors, then this chemical subgroup. And this is where it gets a little tricky. The neonicotinoids are 4A, where Altus is a 4D. And of course, 4C is expired. So the insect doesn't know the difference. These are based on subunits or subgroups, but really overall, it's very, very, very close to the similar mode of action as a neonicotinoid. So when you look at the IRAC committee designation, looking at the four, we have the 4A, the neonicotinoids, 4B, nicotine, and 4C is sulfoxifer. Now, sulfoxifer is one of the active ingredients in expire and expire was removed uh, several years ago. I do believe the product is making a comeback. It's a combination of spinoteram, which is very similar to spinosad or conserve. And then sulfoxifer, again, going back, is very, very close in terms of mode of action to the neonicotinoids. And then for D, the butanolides, that's where Altus comes into play, okay? So let me show you some efficacy data we've done uh, with mealybugs. Mealybugs to me is like the, the, the pest of the 21st century. And some data here, let me go over this. So what we have here is Altus flanicomite aria. And these are weekly applications. And that's the key for mealybugs, it's weekly applications and thorough coverage of all plant parts. And you can see after three weeks, this is on coleus plants, we were getting 100% mortality. That's what you wanna see but it takes about three applications to do that on a weekly basis. And we'll kind of come back to that when we look at some other products uh, during the course of the presentation. Now, let's look at drench applications. Now, we look at preventative drench applications or those that you apply before the pest is present. We consider those preventative. Curative applications are made when the insect is there. You start seeing mealybugs. And when you look at the data, you can see that both Altus and Flanicomite aria, very, very low mortality. This is percent mortality of citrus mealybugs, and 20% is not very, very good. It doesn't even reach the 50% case. The main reason is that in our studies that we've been conducting over 10 years, the systemic insecticides don't work on citrus mealybug. And this is one of our publications that you can download and read and if you're having some issues with insomnia, I think it's going to help cure that very, very quickly. So the, the statement that's very critical is at the very bottom. Therefore, based on the result of the study, 
Systemic insecticides are not effective against the citrus mealybug in greenhouse production systems, which means you have to rely on spray applications. And that means thorough coverage of all plant parts and uh, basically coverage and then frequency of application. Okay, here's another study we did where the y-axis is the mean number of live citrus mealybug nymphs and egg laying females. And this is the untreated check. And these are drench applications. You can see we're not getting much mortality, but the altus, this last one here, is a spray application. And we evaluate the mortality after 48 hours. And we see we get we get pretty good kill with the spray applications, but not so much with the systemic applications applied to this growing medium. Again, systemic insecticides are not effective against citrus mealybug. Well, what about the effect of Altus on natural enemies? We do a tremendous amount of work looking at natural enemies, and can you incorporate them with uh, certain materials or not? So what I want to show you is the work we do with row beetles on the top right, left, and Oris insidiosus, the insidious flower bug, on the right. These are laboratory studies. They're petri dishes that we call worst case scenarios. So if they survive this type of bioassay, they're going to survive in the greenhouse. And what we found with Altus is very interesting for row beetle. After 68 hours of exposure, you see some level of lethality. But what's really striking with Aureus, it kills them. I mean, it is absolutely toxic after 24 hours to Aureus insidiosus. So obviously, obviously that tells you that the insidious flower bug and Altus cannot be uh, used together. And if you want some more um, anti-insomnia reading, here's another pu publication that highlights more of the details regarding uh, those studies. Okay, number two, picana. Picana is a combination of pyrethrins and canola oil. It's registered for use in greenhouses, shade houses, nurseries, hoop houses, and greenhouse container grown nursery crops. 12 hour REI. It's a contact only targeting a wide variety of insect and mite pests. The mode of action is the prolonging the opening of the sodium channels, that's due to pyrethrins, and suffocation or membrane disruption due to the oil. Now, one, one of the interesting concepts is, if you get away from the neonicotinoids, does that mean that you're not going to impact the bees? And the answer is no. If you read the label, the product says, the, the label states the product, the product is highly toxic to bees when exposed to direct treatments on blooming crops and weeds. And that's something that's very important to understand is the neonicotinoids are the safest insecticides to humans. And the information regarding honeybees is still in dispute. But when you stop using neonicotinoids, some of the other materials available are just as toxic to honeybees and bumblebees as the neonicotinoids might be. I just want to get that point across. Uh, We've seen that. I wrote a book chapter last year on it, and what we're seeing is not the neonicotinoids being problematic, but fungicides, surfactants, and insect growth regulators being more of an issue. Picana, there's the label, pyrethrins, and canola oil. And we've done some research. This is with Western flower thrips, and this is how we conduct our studies using yellow Gerber daisy cut flowers. Uh, we infest them with thrips. We spray the we spray. We cut the flowers off, take them back to the lab, and then count the number of live and dead thrips per flower. What we found with Pygana, Pygana was about 40% mortality with about one application. So we haven't even reached the 50% mortality stage. So Pygana, um, you're going to have to make more than one application, obviously. This was a single application, and then we did an evaluation uh, probably 24 to 48 hours after the treatments were applied. So the, the next product is not new, but it has a new trade name. It's Novato, it's Clofentacine. It was formerly called Ovation and Applause. Now the trade name from OHP is Novato. Um, this is a mite growth regulator. It targets only mites and it's primarily an ovicide, although it may have some indirect effects on the larva nymphs, but it has no effect on the adults. The mode of action under the IRAC designation is a 10I, 10A, indicating growth in embryogenesis inhibitor. And some of the studies have shown it has minimal negative effects on certain predatory mites. Again, some of these products you, you can integrate with biologicals, some you may not be able to. 
Okay, let's talk about a, a new one, Ventigra, BASF, a phytopyrophon. Uh, it's registered for greenhouses, shade houses, and tearscapes, vegetable transplants. Its activity is by ingestion, and it does have translamor activity. That's what we call local systemic activity, where the material doesn't uh, move like a true systemic. It's kind of like a burn. It's localized, providing maybe up to 14 days of residual activity after the residue is dry. 12-hour uh, REI, the targeted insects are primarily sucking insects, including aphids, mealybugs, scales, and whiteflies. The mode of action, the mode of action is the 9D. These are called selective feeding blockers. Sensitive crops include coleus, poinsettia and brac, and patients and petunias. Now again, let's look at bee activity. The label states, although ventricle is not acutely toxic to bees, the use of the maximum single application rate may have some short-term behavioral effects or indirect effects on adult bees. However, no long-term impacts on bees and colony health are expected. Now, again, being a scientist, I have not seen these papers come out, but this is what the label states. So when we look at the IRAC designation, let's look at the selective feeding blockers. Group 9, that includes Endeavor, and Rikar. There is Ventigra. In addition, flanicamide or Aria, which has now been changed from 9 to 29, is still a selective feeding blocker. So from a standpoint of mode of action, it's not really a new mode of action. Now you have four selective feeding blockers, Endeavor, Rikar, Aria, and Ventigra. Okay. So that's the issue with these new pesticides. Some of these and I'll show you more, do not have new modes of action. So let's look at some data we did with mealybugs. The y-axis is the mean percent citrus mealybug mortality, and you can see Ventigra with one application about 35%, but when you do a second application, you get 70%. Now, what we've done a lot is looking at capsule or surfactants. Do they enhance activity? And we have not been able to show that. Here's Ventigra with capsule. And there's capsule by itself, and re really no difference overall in terms of enhancing the efficacy uh, of the material. Okay, so the key for mealybugs is thorough coverage of all plant parts and frequent applications. Okay, the next product, Velifera or Velifera, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, and the active ingredient is another Bavaria bassiana. This is the same as Botanigard, except the strain is different. Botanigard is GHA, where here it's PPRI5339. Okay, this is an entomopathogenic fungus. Kills only insects. You can apply, it applies a foliar spray, uh, many, many commodity crops. Activity is by contact only. Has a 12-hour REI, and the targeted insects are aphids, mealybugs, mites, thrips, and whiteflies. The use rates are 3 to 13 fluid ounces per 100 gallons, and the pre-harvest interval is zero days. Okay, now let's look at bee activity. The label states this product is potentially pathogenic to beneficial insects and honeybees. Do not apply while bees or other pollen insects are foraging in the area. Are you getting the message now that if even though it's not a neonicotinoid, you can still have harmful impacts on bees. Yes. So here's some data we generated mealybugs, very similar to Ventigra. Here you see Velifera and Velifera and the and the capsule. No, no increase in efficacy. The thing with these is you got to make multiple applications. This was just one application, and then we did I think an evaluation after seven days. So just like Ventigra, it's going to take several applications to suppress the white flop, the, the, excuse me, the mealybug populations. Okay, got that? So let's talk about the last two. Sarissa, uh, cyclonidoprol, it's used in greenhouses, shade houses, nurseries, four hour REI, target pests, caterpillars, mealybugs, thrips, and whiteflies. Mode of action, IRAT group 28, that's the selective activation of ranidin receptors group. Again, Bee activity. This product is highly toxic to bees and other pollinating insects exposed to direct treatment or to residues in or blooming crops or weeds. 
get the message. So here is Selecting an Autoprol. Now let's go back to IRAC 28, Ryanidin receptor modulators. We already have two, Chlornantronylopol, acelaprine, Cyantronylopol, mainspring. Now we have a third one, Cyclonidoprol, Sarissa. Again, not a new no mode of action. It's a new material, but not a new pesticide. We have looked at it for Western flower thrips. This is when it was a numbered compound, and Sarissa does work on Western flower thrips as a spray. Okay, Mainspring does too as a spray in a drench, but it does work as a spray application. The last one is a combination of Sarissa and Aria called Pradia. And it's very similar to Sarissa, except Sarissa has a four hour REI. This one has a 12 hour. The target insect pests are the same. Now, in this case, there are two modes of action. There's a selective activation of random receptor, that's group 28, and then the selective feeding blocker, just like Ventigra. Ventigra was a 9D, but this is flinicamide, and flinicamide was in the 9 group, now it's in 29, and again, the B activity due to, due to cyclonidopol is the same as I showed you for the label for Sarissa. Let's look at some data. Here is the label, so there you see, this is Sarissa, and this is Aria. There is Aria, the actual product, and you can see the active ingredient is flinicamide. So, We've done some work with mealybugs. This is this is the same uh, graph I showed you for Ventigra. And again, you can get mortality of mealybugs, but it takes several applications. And we were able to get about oh, less than 70%, but we need to get that higher. So coverage and frequency of application are essential in dealing with citrus mealybugs. Okay? What about the effect of natural enemies? Well, we also looked at some of the products I mentioned before, and what we have found is Picana, Sarissa, and Pradia, well, they have some, they have some toxicity on Oris insidiosis or insidious flower bug. However, Ventigra and Bellifera do not. That's 100% sur adult survival after 96 hours, so they have minimal direct impact or harmful effects on Aureus insidiosis, and very similar to row beetles. After 96 hours, Sarissa is very harmful to the row beetle, whereas Ventigra and Bellifera, just like the insidious flower bug, have minimal to any effects, harmful effects on the row beetle, okay? And this, of course, we're generating a large database we have to publish in a trade journal article on our work with row beetles and uh, insidious flower bugs and the impact of not only mitocides and insecticides, but also fungicides. And if there's any questions regarding these, let me know. Again, these are petri dish studies, worst case scenario. If they survive this bioassay, they're going to survive in the greenhouse. Got that? Okay, let's move on to another topic that I'm really excited to to talk about because it's related to our research, and that is Western flower thrips. How many out there deal with Western flower thrips? I see lots of hands. The adult on the left, the larva on the right. Why are they a pest? Well, they cause direct damage by feeding on the leaves and flowers, but most importantly, and why there is such a high input of pesticides and insecticides is because they vector or transmit the toss ball viruses and patient the chronic spot and tomato spot of wilt virus. Whenever you have an insect that's associated with a virus, then there's greater impact or input from insecticide applications. So why is Western flower thrips a major insect pest? Well, this is not an not exhaustive list, but here's some of the reasons. High female, re high female reproductive capacity, broad host range, rapid life cycle, but the really important one is resistance to insecticides. Does anybody know how many active ingredients or insecticides Western flower thips are resistant to today? The number is 153, okay? 
very, very important. They vector the virus. They have a very interesting feeding habit, cryptic behavior. They like tight enclosed areas, and they're about two millimeters in length. Okay. Now let's look at the biological control of Western flower thrips. And what life stages are susceptible to biological control agents? Okay. The first instar, the eggs are embedded in plant tissue. So they escape exposure not only from biological control agents, but also from insecticides. The first instar larva is fed upon by Neocelis cucumbris and Amblyseus sforzkii. Those are two predatory mites. Okay. The Oris insidiosus, which is the insidious flower bug, which I mentioned already, will feed on the first, second instar larva and the adults. So it attacks, multi, it attacks more life stages, and even the adults and the nymphs will feed on those three life stages. Then the western flower thips goes into the growing medium and undergoes what we call a pre-pupa and then a pupal stage. These stages do not feed. They have minimal activity, but they escape exposure from almost all insecticides. There are several biological control agents commercially available. The first one is Stradiolalet simitus, formerly called Hypoacus miles. It will, will feed on the pupil stage, although the data is somewhat sketchy uh, based on reading the papers. However, the rove beetle, Delosha, formerly a Theta coriara, does feed on the both the pre-pupa and the pupil stage. How do I know that? I had a graduate student, PhD, do her research on that, and we will talk about that, but I want to talk about row beetle adults and larvae. The adults are on the top and the larvae, both life stages feed on fungus ant larvae and western flower through pupil stages, both the pre-pupa and the pupa. You can buy Delosia coriara, formerly called Atheta, from many suppliers out there. This is just one formulation. And here's a close-up of the adults. The adults uh, are in the growing medium. They don't like light, so if you put your lights on, they'll go in the growing medium. But the adults are voracious predators of fungus ant larva and western flower thrips adults. By the way, these are not life-size. These are close of taking out with a microscope camera. Well, how do I know they work on Western flower thips? That's because we have done studies. My graduate student, Ying, Pong, Ying Ping Li, uh, did some really nice work as, for a PhD. And these are the publications you can download in Cure Your Insomnia, reading about how the row beetle does feed on the Western flowers of pupil stages. Okay? So this is science. Science is still critical. Okay? So when you look at Western flower thips biological control or suppression, you have the above ground life stages and you can use the insidious flower bug again, which will feed on the first and second instar and the adults. You have your predatory mites, which feed on the first or second instar. Or you can use one of the entomopathogenic fungi, such as botanogard or ancora. And that would take care of the above ground life stages. Then you can use Delosia coriara, the row beetle, for the stages, the pupa that are in the growing media. Okay. But this is a way to deal with Western flower thrips from a biological based program. So uh, I want to move on to a very important topic, and it's actually related to biological control, and that is quality assessment. Determining what you've received from the, the distributor supplier is alive. Okay, so let's start, let's start talking about that. When you receive shipments of biological control agents, you have to make sure they're packaged correctly. That is, styrofoam containers with uh, either peanuts or newspaper to prevent the natural enemies or the biological control agent packaging from jostling around because that could possibly cause some injury, okay? So make sure that the companies that are sending in the material are providing you with proper packaging. Then when you get them, you wanna make sure they're alive. Uh, we have we know we know from a fact from science that dead insects will not kill live insects. We are the science is settled on that. Okay, but you want to ask yourself, are they alive when I get them? They've gone through the the shipping process, and if something happens in the shipping process, either they get too cold or hot, that can compromise their they can compromise their ability. 
to not only be a functional individual, but also if they're alive or dead. So how do you know what you purchase is alive and functional? Well, that's what we're going to start covering. So when you get a box of these predatory mites and these sachets, have you ever asked yourself, is the same number in each one of these? And how do they do that? Okay, that's a good question you should ask. Now, here's what we do. Working with producers, in fact, I was at one of our uh, local ones yesterday. Uh, they're doing biologic control for thrips in their uh, uh, cutting and sealing stock. And what we do is we bring the sachets back and we're going to cut them open to make sure that there's some living mites in there uh, that are eventually going to come out and attack and feed upon and destroy the thrips. Well, when you open these up, you start seeing this brand. Now, in this brand is the predatory mite, in this case, Neosteuthis cucumers, but also there's a brand mite. And the brand mite looks very different from the beneficial mite, predatory mite. So you want to make sure you don't get them confused, okay? But you want to make sure that there's something living in there, because if not, you want, to you want to contact the biologic control supplier as soon as possible, okay? Now, this is very laborious, and it is, and we do like sampling occasionally uh, when we visit growers. But another very easy way is to take the, set, the uh, popsicle sticks, bend them, and mount them on a yellow sticky card. And what you're looking for are the mites to fall down on the yellow sticky card or crawl down to the base and get captured. And that will tell you if you've got functional individuals in that sachet. A couple things about these sachets I want to point out. You don't want to get them wet because then mold will grow on the brand. And if you can't protect, protect them from direct sunlight because the temperature can get very hot in here and actually be so high that it can either uh, kill the mites or reduce their behavior. Okay. So here's quality assessment of life life parasitoids. This is a mason jar, and I'll talk more about this. So what we do is we take mason jars and we took a one inch by one inch section of a yellow sticky card, mount it to the underside of the lid. And what we do is we assess the number of adults that emerge and are captured on the yellow sticky cards. And that's a quality assessment determining the number of functional individuals, this case parasitoids, based on captures on the yellow sticky cards that emerge from the release card, okay? We usually leave them in there for about 48 to uh, 72 hours. And by that time, most of the parasitoids should have emerged from the parasitized pupa, white flight pupa in this case. So I wanna share some data that we're, we uh, have done and we continue to build on is looking at the quality assessment of the white fly parasitoid Eret monster ceramicus. Okay, so we received release cards from a distributor and we did the same thing I showed you here, put them in mason jars and then counted the number of adults that came out. But in addition, we looked at the number that were uh, dead at the bottom of the jar and more importantly, the number that did not emerge. And this is the first shipment we got. I have to hide the guilty, the companies. So when you look at these cards, these are parasitized pupa of the white fly. I want to focus on number on sticky card. For one company, we average is 4.1. On the other company, 10.2. The number that did not emerge was about 13 and 9. Okay. From the other distributor, we got 5.9 on the yellow stick and 18. That's quite a substantial difference in the number of functional individuals. And there was really no difference in the number that do, did not emerge. Okay. So that was our first shipment from two companies. In our second shipment, it's the opposite. We got 14.14 14 14 uh, on the sticky card versus eight and about six to nine that did not emerge. Okay. And then we got 20 versus eight. Now that is substantial. That's 20 live adults on the sticky card versus eight within about a 48 hour period. And then the number that did not emerge was also substantial. So these are things you need to be aware of when you're releasing the parasitoids. What's, what is coming off these release cards? How many functional adults are emerging? And then how many are not? Very, very important. 
So I want to show you some of the data we generated this uh, last year, working with a, a greenhouse producer on a biocontrol program with poinsettias. Okay, and so what we have is yellow sticky cards monitoring for the adults. That is set, that gives us sort of assessment of how well the biological control agents, in this case, the parasitoid, is working. So these are the biobests, and we were using Eret monstrous rumicus. And there you see these are the parasitized sweet potato whitefly pupa. That's where the adults will emerge. So again, we did the same thing as I showed you previously. We did a quality assessment, quality assessment to determine the number of functional individuals, adult parasitoids that emerge from the release cards. And this is what Eret monstrous rumicus looks like on the yellow sticky card. Doesn't look too happy, does it? But that's what we're, that's the, uh, we count the number of the individuals on the yellow sticky card. So let me show you some data. On October 5th, which we, re we released these on September 30th, we caught 37 adults on one card and 40 on the other. The next day, we caught 46 and 52 on those same cards. But then after day 14, we caught 69 adults and 74, and that was a over 90% emergence rate. So that's what we wanted to see. We wanted to see lots of functional adults coming off those cards and getting into the crop and attacking the white flies. Okay? Very easy to do, but it tells you, it gives you a lot of good information. But what about nematodes? You just can't mix them to mix them and expect them to go off and do the job. Well, if they're alive, they look like this. They're curly, they move around. If they're straight like this, they're dead. And we do know that dead nematodes do not kill insects, okay? Well, how do you do a quality assessment? Well, what you do is you prepare a sample of your uh, solution from the formulation. You take about 0.2 to 0.3 mils, put it in a Petri dish, look under a microscope or a 16X hand lens, and you'll see the nematodes either moving around or straight, okay? Very, that's what we do in all our trials is we do a quality assessment of the biologic control agents before we release them or utilize them. In this case, standing in the Feltii, which is sold as a product nemesis. Got that? Okay, what about some data? Well, this is from a former graduate student uh, we looked at different brands of entomopathogenic product, uh, nematodes, and we have to hide the guilty, except for any misses. This is percent live entomopathogenic nematodes and the effect of juveniles. And you can see over 98% live. That is great. But company three, only half of them were alive. That's not so good. Some were 80%, some were 60 So. That's really, it's really critical to assess whether they're alive or dead before you make the application or release them and then save some to test if they're actually alive or not. Very, very critical because if you think they're alive every time you get them, uh, really that's not the way to go. And the fa if you think that the biocontrols failed, it may be because of quality control, quality of the natural enemies. So here's another insomnia solver. Uh, this is we did quality assessment of entomopathogenic nematodes. And if you want some follow-up information, it's all there in the Hort Technology in 2008. Okay? So I can't stress it enough that you can't assume, and you know what that means, that these organisms are alive when you release them. You just have to do a quick, a quick assessment to make sure they are alive. Okay? So, uh, as I round out, uh, this pub book was written for you growers out there. It hasn't quite made the New York Times bestseller list. It's moving up. But uh, if you have this, fine. If you don't, it was written for you. Easy. It's no scientific terms. It's very easy. I, I, I guess Leanne might have a copy of Rosa does too. But uh, it's on Amazon.com. So. I want to thank you for your attention. I hope you all learned something during the course of the presentation. Again, uh, although we're doing this virtual or Zoom, we're still out there providing education material. So with that, that's all I have. If you'd like to provide some feedback, uh, there's my email address.